Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Yogan. I'm the Chief Economist at Bayes. I, I'm going to talk about basically kind of the last 30 years of kind of um, in particular competitiveness and productivity policy. And it's a great pleasure to be here to talk about this. Uh, firstly, to, uh, basically kind of to say thank you to Nick over the years because he has been a great friend of DTI, uh, Biz, Bayes, uh, in helping us understand. We have listened, even if transport haven't, about what makes for a good economy. Um, so to thank you for that. And also, as someone who trained as an economic historian, uh, I did enough economics to join the GS legitimately, to be clear, uh, to talk about the kind of the history of some of this uh, policy area. Where's the clicker? Is that, is that, there it is. OK. Right, so basically three elements of the talk. One, just why economic history is important, why it's useful, especially in government and thinking around policy. Uh, then it kind of look at the last 30 years of competitiveness performance. We touched on a lot of this in the panel, but I want to give a particular kind of medium term take on it. And then look at some of the analytical directions of the future where I think we in government would be interested in, in where further research could take place. So for me, Economic history, studying it, why it's useful in government is three, three main areas. One, it does give a sense of perspective. You can have too much perspective, but the fact is, one of the earliest pieces of work I did in government was looking at long-run productivity and looking at the Madison, an early vintage of the Madison data set. And as Nick pointed out earlier, the kind of the difference between the UK and the US is around starts in around the kind of turn of the century, 1920s, about there, depending on when you pick it. And the difference is about 0.1%, 0.2% per annum. But they maintain that. The states maintain that advantage for 100 years. Right? So small differences are hard to achieve but have big effects. And that's important because often you will find in government, people will say things like, senior officials will say things like, I want to close the productivity gap with Germany in the next five years. It's more complicated than that. So you can get to say you know, why that may be not necessarily right minister. Secondly, real life is messy. Anyone spending time in the archive knows that you know, data sets are imperfect. You're dealing with boundedly rational individuals. Um, things don't seem to make sense. That is actually a pretty good description of life in government. So it kind of socialises you to what life is really like. And you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, we have been here before. Um, you know, we, we, we talked about the, the Great Depression. Um, you know, we're looking at productivity performance. There are elements that keep coming back and understanding why that is the case and spotting it and being able to kind of structure it is, is a valuable kind of knowledge base. It also helps if you're dealing with uh, very, very young treasury officials who will say things like, it's the 19, it's just like, I deal with industrial policy at the moment. And they'll say, it's just the 1970s again. But which part of the 1970s? Actually, are we talking about the workers' cooperative at Meriden Motorcycles around the corner? Or are we talking about the MinTech investments in Cambridge, which to an extent helped form a, formalize the um, Cambridge cluster, or the nationalization of Rolls-Royce, which to an extent safeguarded one of the crown jewels of our industrial base. It helps to know this stuff. It also helps to, because you can bring out uh, quotes like this. Um, this is from 1961, so I think it's Selwyn Lloyd as chancellor. But what you find throughout our kind of political economic history are reports by Board of Trade, Treasury, about our economic performance. And this picks up some traditional themes. We're talking around here around competitors, modernizing our market economy, removing barriers, the effect of operation of the market economy, perennial things that keep on coming up in our kind of economic policy discussions. And the way I tend to think about, uh, and this is not particularly rigorous at all, but if I think about our competitiveness policy, there's kind of a period, insofar as we have a policy, up to the First World War, where it's partly around using levers to stimulate better, faster ships, motivated by effectively competition with, in, with Germany, military competition. There's a period after the war where this, well, the Second World War, where this quote comes from, where our policy is motivated by uh, the exchange rate, Bretton Woods, staying on the peg. So the point about competitors is around, you know, what's motivating that? That is about having the balance of trade so that we can retain our, our Kind of peg with the dollar. Um, and there's a period after effectively Black Wednesday um, where it's a kind of Heseltinian productivity, competitiveness, living standard driven kind of policy mission behind our competitiveness policy. And that's really what I want to go through in the next 
part of the presentation is just to look at actually how have we done over the last 20, 30 years. In part, this is a, an order, I've worked on a lot of this period on this policy. So partly it's an audit of my kind of performance as an official. And we all kind of understand a bit about some of the question, the kind of context behind some of the panel discussion we had earlier. So I'll go through a series of charts. The model in my head is a relatively standard production function. So we're talking productivity. We look at basically the competitive environment. We look at um, skills, innovation, we look at investment. I'm trying to see how, how we've done over that kind of 20, 30 year period. So this is our old friend, the productivity gap. All familiar with that. This was re referenced this morning. This is the kind of um, output per hour worked. There's a question about when the flat lining begins. You know, 2005 is a financial crisis. The important thing is it's pretty much flat and way off trend. Right, so some, something has happened to our productivity. So let's go through the kind of underlying drivers. Now, I've picked a series of charts. Other charts are available. These charts you'll probably hate or have better charts available. But the point is, they are illustrative of the point. And um, you know, we, can, we can provide dozens more charts that basically make the same issue. So if you think about the business environment, this is the kind of a measure of the openness of the UK economy. You can look at imports, same story. If you can look at OECD measures of essentially ease of access to the UK economy. And what you find is, you know, we are a pretty open economy. There's nothing going on there that's particularly unusual to suggest that we're getting less open to uh, the world economy. We look at regulation. There are loads of measures on regulation. Uh, this is labour market, this is OECD. This is basically legislative. Um, again, the UK, lower is better in this context. The UK is a relatively low regulated labour market economy. Same kind of story for product regs. If you look at the World Bank measures of doing business, if you look at the OECD overall metrics, if you look at the World Economic Forum measures, if you look at the Institute of Management Development, the Economist intelligence unit measures, they all tell the same story. We are a fantastically open, deregulated liberal economy. So if you're looking for barriers to why we are the way we are, it's not obvious that it's here. Right. This, I think, is a great chart. This is a great story. Right? This is the proportion of tertiary education. When I graduated in 94, um, about 15% of the workforce was graduate. There's been this relentless growth. It's a terrific story. And actually, the UK position on here is understated. Because in, the, in England, in particular, UK overall, uh, tertiary education means the full fat three-year degree. In other countries, it's a level four qualification, a technical qualification, an H&D, HNC, something equivalent to that. So this, this is a great story. And I think if you were in Department of Education and Science in 1991, when you're thinking about the expansion of education, imagine what the you thought the world would look like in 2016 when nearly half the population was a graduate. How productive were we going to be when this happened? Um, this is another chart. Uh, Terra referred to this. Uh, this is the workplace training. This is LFS microdata. Um, what this shows is this relentless collapse in workplace training over the same kind of period. So people are not, so we're, we're producing flexible economy, open economy. We're putting huge investments into our workforce, public sector side, and it's been successful. Businesses are not investing in their people. This is a kind of measure, essentially, of the science base. This is a citations metric. Uh, the, again, the UK does very, very well in this. There are loads of other measures of our science base. We always do well, and we've been continuing to do well. So the quality of our science and research base is excellent. Um, and there is no obvious reason here what, you know, for our productivity performance. Look at R&D, though. The R&D, and I know R&D is an imperfect measure, but it's illustrative for the point. R&D flat lines. So we are producing loads of graduates, excellent science base, businesses not investing in R&D. And does investing more generally. This is the uh, investment chart. Our businesses, again, despite the context, despite the people, despite the ideas that are being generated, not investing in fixed plants and equipment. Um, 
And there's a couple of points this morning around both management techniques, but also Gus was talking about the, um, uh, you know, the well-being measures in the workplace. And you know, these, these are good productivity. Why aren't they being taken up? So there is something here looking across the last 30 years. That's a lot of the things that academics, international organizations would recommend the UK to do to raise productivity, to close the productivity gap, we've actually done. And actually done them pretty well in broad output terms. Yet we haven't got the outcomes that you would have hoped or expected or thought you deserved. Um, what we do see is something odd at the level of the firm, that despite that competitive dynamism, the fact that we've got the best competition regime in the, in the G20, new ideas, uh, new techniques, skilled workers are not, being, are not being dealt with, not being used productively. Something is odd in the nature of our firm dynamics. And that's difficult because that's hard for economics to try and crack open. It's hard for economic history to crack open. Arguably, it's a kind of subject for business history, but business history tends to be kind of case study driven and a bit ad hoc and not generalizable. So it's almost like what we need is a quantitative business history to try and understand what's really going on at the level of the firm. Now, about 100 years ago, Gus O'Donnell did a review called Adding It Up, which created an evidence-based policy fund. Um, and I was one of the uh, project managers on that. And we hired a young academic called Jonathan Haskell to do uh, a piece of work called Admi the Administrative Data Linking Project. This is very worthy. It was putting uh, government data sets together and to try and generate some, some new insights. Um, and Jonathan did a really good job, but it was hindered because uh, the data wasn't very good. We didn't really have any processing power. And the analytical techniques were hard and bespoke and really, really difficult. Um, now, imagine if you lived in a world where basically processing power was abundant. The economy just threw off data as a byproduct of its activities. And if you wanted a cutting edge analytical technique, Google's just put it for free in the kind of TensorFlow library. And that's the world we're now in. So it gives us an opportunity to start cracking open what's actually ha happening at the level of the firm. And I just want to talk you through kind of three kind of areas of analysis that we've been working on to try and drill further down and work out what's actually going on. So we've got, um, the first one is this thing called a data-enabled change accelerator. It sounds awful. What it is is HMRC's business level data, right? So we've basically got the data on tax records of five million businesses. And we're able to link that and, and work out what actually is going on, what, what determines growth. And what we thought going into it, our prior was, Essentially, firm level growth would be largely random. You wouldn't be able to pick it. We were wrong. Actually, when you run the algorithms on it, you can find patterns. You can begin to pick winners. And the most important thing that comes out of that is there's a series of factors and characteristics that seem to <coughs> predict performance. Really interest, interesting stuff. Second one, incentive structures. This is some work that's going on between ourselves, Price Waterhouse, and the University of Oxford. And that's effectively looking at the level of, you know, um, management compensation practices and seeing whether that has uh, effects on investment performance and their willingness to do things like R&D. And it looks like it does. Interesting. Second one here is around the Longitudinal Educational Outcomes Database. One of the parents of that is Rachel Samby Thomas, who is the registrar at the University of Oxford. Um, it has also been described as the Manhattan Project for Higher Education. But what this one does is it links your academic record to your pay-as-you-earn record. So you begin to see what people get for their degree. Obviously, they get lots of things other than money, however. Um, actually, there's a thing here. Anyone care to guess? This was dropped last week. Um, DFE dropped this data last week. Anyone care to have a go at what, um, any, what graduates, PhD earnings after five years? Any PhD students in the room? What do you think you're going to be getting? What subject are you? Are oh, you all right then? <laughs> there you go. So interesting, economics was, I mean, this is at PhD, so it's probably academic, so not much variation. Um, but yes, what you're beginning to see is 
some quite interesting outcomes from that. Economics generally wears the top hat for some, for some particular reason. Maybe just economists to respond to financial incentives. Um, communication studies, actually, with physics. Unusual result. Uh, and actually, you see this at undergraduate level. We hear a lot about um, STEM shortages. Um, but actually, when you look at undergraduate level, five years to graduation, there isn't that much difference at all between a physics graduate and a history graduate. Market's not saying there's a big difference here. And incidentally, I think the best paper I've seen in the last two years is this Deeming and Nore one. But if we come across it, it's an MBR paper, and it tries to understand what's going on with the skills shortage debate. What they do is they look at an equivalent data set in the States. And what they basically find is that for STEM degrees, what businesses actually want from STEM graduates is the vintage of technology embodied within them. So in the short term, they really want those people. But once that technology has been essentially replaced, they're not that interested. So STEM graduate earnings plateau really early, and you're much better off over a long period doing something else. So it's as if the STEM shortage thing is a perennial issue about technology rather than necessarily a persistent shortage in STEM um, across the economy, which is, again, really interesting from the perspective of how we encourage our children and what to study. Because you know, we, there's a huge amount of effort saying you should be studying physics, STEM, whatever. Maybe not. Um, the, I will get shot in the department for saying that, though. Uh, final one is around, this is, a, this is another piece of work we've been doing, um, looking at technology diffusion. And it was mentioned a few times today about um, diffusion, capability for growth, adapt, you know, um, absorptive capacity. Measuring the diffusion of technology in the economy is, is hard, but measuring people is relatively easy. So taking the insight from the, the Nore paper, um, job adverts. You know, there's now databases of like every job advert put on the internet. And if you can basically follow the job adverts, what people are asking for, you can see how technologies and ideas diffuse across the economy. That's the theory. And that's what we've been looking at. And this is some kind of unpublished work we've been doing, looking at essentially how job adverts diffuse across our economy. And I think just what's, what's quite interesting is you do see this kind of point around Mansfield. Um, yeah. But basically, um, universities, cities that have got high levels of effectively absorbed capacity, or you were talking about Mo Bramovitz earlier, social capability for growth. They seem to adopt these, they put the job adverts out, they adopt the technologies much faster than other parts of the country. So again, understanding why that is, what we can do about that, opens up entirely new areas of policy for us. So I think that's where I'm going to leave the presentation. I think it's quite a nice place because fundamentally what it does show is there is a, you know, new techniques that are kind of now available allow us to have new insights to policy issues that we've traditionally parked because we haven't had the data or capability to do it, but actually reinforces some of the kind of things from economic history, like social capability, that we may not always have front and center of our minds. Thank you.